is 1111. It says, Scott reminded me 100 years since the armistice from the First World War was signed. And it's, it started as Armistice Day, and now it's morphed into Veterans Day. And so I just wanted to take a moment to, you know, give that a little, little weight and to acknowledge any of you who might be a veteran. So if you are a veteran, would you just stand for a moment? Won't make you stand long, just to, yeah, thank you. Thank you. In times of peace and um, in times of conflict. Um, tennis great Arthur Ashe said, true heroism is remarkably sober and very undramatic. It's not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. So thank you. I also want to take a moment and introduce my beloved husband, Reverend Hal Milton, who's here with us this morning. So thank you. Yeah. We've uh, served together in ministry. We've not done, we've, you know, this works, that doesn't work. This works, that doesn't work, but you know. So um, at our Minister License Teacher Conference um, in October, I think, Reverend Christian, well, actually, we had talked earlier, but she told me to read this book. You can see I read this book. <laughs> and to speak on chapter 10 this morning. So I had to read the whole book. I couldn't just go to the, the um, cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> or watch the movie again for the upteenth time. I mean, I love it because it's about the movie. And who hasn't seen the movie? And so everything was, and plus the whiz, you know. Saw the whiz, saw um, Wicked. You know, it's, this is our story, isn't it? And these stories, just because they didn't happen doesn't mean that they're not true. So, um, Dorothy returns to Kansas after her adventures in Oz, we know. And those of you who don't know this, this whole community has been working with this book called The Wizard of Us, which takes a metaphysical slant on this story, which is about the most metaphysical story of all. It's the hero's journey. It's, you know, you get the call, you leave, stuff happens, you come back and you're different. Right? I mean, that's basically the story. Okay, goodbye. Let's eat. I hear there's cake out there. So... Dorothy returns to Kansas. She's transformed. Joseph Campbell calls her one who can walk between two worlds. And she's learned so much, you know, is much more now than a frustrated farm girl. She's a hero, a heroine. And she's traveled far. She's risked everything. And since it's her journey, it's also our journey. And we understand that, like Dorothy, we carry everything we need inside of ourselves. We are the scarecrow, the tin man. We are the uh, cowardly lion, and we're loaded with this activated brain and heart and courage. And we're also Toto, the life force, faithfully prodding us forward with gusto. I had a great um, um, experience with that Toto active life force this morning because um, last night, Hal and I, preparing to leave early this morning to get here, we had made, I had made a frittata yesterday. I thought, we'll just heat that up for breakfast. So I did that. I ate mine. I left Hal's on the table, went upstairs. Hal comes up and says, where's my uh, breakfast? On the table. Well, our little um, Kirby <laughs> decided it was his second breakfast. So there you go, reminding us of the joy of, you know, of dog, doggedness. And we also learned that we need those bad guys, you know, the witches and the flying monkeys to keep us sharp, to keep things interesting. And I learned a brand new word, entelechy. Was that a new word for all of you? Isn't that a cool? I even looked up how to say it in case that C-H-Y, you know. But it's entelechy, and it means that soul of us, that um, great friend, the wizard, and um, who oversees us and guides us and loves us unconditionally. And we understand, of course, we need to look no farther than our own backyard to find the answers and energy we need. And Jean Houston um, challenges us, and she says, but why now? Why have we been born now? What's it about being on planet Earth now? Why in all human history are we here now? Um, and she says that we know that whatever individuality that we carry in our soul, in our entelechy, is needed on the planet right now. Some of us have an idea of what that is. Some of us don't have a clue, but we're here anyway. 
it's like we're part of this 14 billion uh, year experiment. And then she calls this a time of renaissance, of new. Um, but I also noticed the book was published in uh, 2012, a little, when the world looked a little bit rosier. And that this word comes from um, the outmoded, dying, impossible situation being reborn, the Renaissance. And we're familiar with the European Renaissance, I'm sure, and the art and the one, all the wonderful things that came out of it when the soul grows and becomes equal to the challenges and is ready to just change things. We have a film festival in Napa right now, and um, Hal and I, in our infinite wisdom, about four years ago, took the challenge to house one of the filmmakers, and then we get free passes. <laughs> so this was our fourth year doing that, and we saw this wonderful film yesterday, and it was a, um, a documentary about W.G. W. Snuffy Walden. Anybody know who he is? So he's a musician um, who kind of went through, you know, he was like the opening band for Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, um, and just went through all the excesses of that time, and then had a moment, an aha moment, became sober, and that was many, many years ago. And it was one of those, the right person at the right time, and he's actually the composer of the, um, What's it called? The music for, the, the theme for um, Sports Night, 30-something, West Wing. Oh. And it just sort of, from this guitar playing, kind of almost junky alcoholic, he just had, so this is a documentary about him. And he was there after the film to talk about it, which was just wonderful. And what really got me again was that timing, because they talked about how the, the sitcoms, the TV shows at that time were dynasty, you know, that kind of stuff, and 30-something. Do you remember that? That was, like, so different. And that, mu you know, it was that blending of time and how that's always available. That's like a little renaissance. You know, it just opened it up to all sorts of new, really relationship-focused um, television rather than greed and violence, which has its place. One of my favorite poets is Mary Oliver. She wrote, this is, this is a, um, something I found recently, and I love it. This is the first, the wildest, and the wisest thing I know. The first, the wildest, and the wisest thing I know. That the soul exists, and it is built entirely out of attentiveness. So when we're sitting in the silence, and we're... Um, breathing, and we're doing all that work to stay present, we are building up that soul. Do you remember that uh, the, the teacher, the kind of mystery school teacher, Gurdjieff, from many years ago, he wouldn't even take any students until they'd passed the age of 35. <laughs> you know, that, that soul-making time of, of that decision, which I believe most of us have made that we're sitting here in this room today. And then she also said, Mary Oliver, tell me what it is that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. So as we follow Dorothy on her journey, we also saw that as she rose in consciousness, as well that her society, the Emerald City, rose in consciousness. And what happened with the monkeys when the, when the witch was killed, and all those things really moved the culture along. And she was reborn. So there's a book that... Um, Houston wrote years ago called The Possible Human. Anybody familiar with that? So, yeah, so that's the one. And then this, she talks in this book about a possible earth. Again, an opportunity to be all that we can be and change our culture. And there's a saying I love in the book that's what the cat caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly. And that this is our butterfly time, the time to ozify our lives. And that everything is energy and vibration, which we know is our third principle, right? The, the law of mind action, that we create our reality by the way we think about it. Not that we make things happen, make the tree fall or the air cleaner, but by the way we think about things, our experience of our life shifts. Because there's always stuff going on, right? And there's a lot of stuff going on now, from the bad air to the fires to you know, the polarization that we're experiencing in our country. However, it's how we hold it. 
There's a great story I just want to share with you, a little aside of something cute and funny about the law of mind action, and it's from a, a minister colleague. A uh, minister is preaching about the law of mind action, and with great passion she preaches that the very thoughts we hold in our minds become our reality. And all during the sermon, she couldn't help but notice that a teenage boy was squirming in his seat while she spoke. And the more she spoke, the more upset the young man became. So when the service was over, she couldn't wait to get a chance to go talk to the young man and ask him what was up. And when she did, the young teenage boy said sheeplessly, well, you know, all I think about these days are girls. And I don't want to become a girl. <laughs> So how do we hold what's going on? You know, in this just this last slice of linear time, bombs were sent to former beloved leaders of our nation, death at a grocery store in Louisville, Kentucky, where my dad's from, because the shooter couldn't get into the church that he wanted to shoot. The church was locked. That you have to lock your church. And we have to lock our churches. That we don't lock consciousness, but we lock the buildings. We tie the camel. 11 shot at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, 12 at a bar at Thousand Oaks. There's a lovely young woman from my town, Napa, who was um, in, uh, in that experience and is no longer with us. An election that most likely further polarized our brother and sister Americans and these fires. I mean, we are so close to these fires. People scrambling to leave their homes up in paradise and just the mayhem that ensued. So how we do we release the stories, let go of the past? I mean, it's nice to talk about it, but how do we do it? How do we hold um, all this in our tender hearts? How do we rise up as a society as we individually rise in consciousness? How do we live up to Houston's view of a possible earth? How do we reconcile our unity statement of faith? We say that we are one power and one presence, active in the universe, in our lives. That's God the good. How do we hold all of this? What is mine to do? What is yours to do? Where is there a map? Do you remember those triptychs that AAA used to do? Now we have our GPSs, but, you know, next step. Go here, eat that, go, you know, get gas, rest for the night. Cynthia Bourgeau is a, heads a mystery school. She's an Episcopal priest. She heads a mystery school in Colorado, which is sort of like a spiritual ongoing thing. Anybody hear of her, Cynthia Bourgeau? And she teaches what she calls unitive seeing. Unitive seeing. And she distinguishes between what she calls unity seeing and mysticism. Now, we like to think, you know, uh, there's a book called Charles Fillmore, American Mystic, that unity is sort of a mystic side of Christianity and that we're mystics because we can just sort of see our oneness. And we have these great experiences, don't we, where we, whether we're doing it just out of our meditation or we're smoking something or drinking something or saying something, where we just get this experience of we're all one, right? What was it the hot dog, the mystic said to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything, you know. <laughs> You've heard that. Oh, that's an old, oh, that's, that's a good one, huh? And we love those feelings of bliss and peace and love for everyone and everything. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a child of the 60s. That was kind of my thing. Well, she says, and I, and I find this distinction very useful for myself as I work with my own consciousness in these interesting times. She says, mysticism is seeing oneness. That's good. Unitive seeing means seeing from oneness. Whew, I got chills with that one. I mean, this is sort of a new, you know, it's all, we, you know, there's all these great teaching. This is sort of a new distinction for me, and I really like it. And maybe it's new to you or something you want to spend some time with. Um, because what happens is we put our emphasis on the experience of the oneness because it really feels good rather than the shift in the perceptual field that, um, that it gives us. 
And mystical always seems to go with the word experience, you know. And then the experience is something we want to have, we have had, we have. And it's an altered state of consciousness. It's something that takes us beyond ourselves. But from the point of view of real spiritual growth, supposedly, it's an immature state. It's a state rather than a stage. So Ken Wilber, you know, the great futurist, an author, philosopher, he writes about this. He says a state is a place you go to. And the stage is a place you come from. An integrated and, and mature spiritual experience. And I'm a little no, more note-bound than I usually am because this is kind of new stuff for me and I really wanted to do a good job with this book. And you guys always call me to come up higher. And I love Jean Houston. I love Reverend Kristen. I love all of you. I've had the pleasure to be with you for years and years and years. Hal spoke here, what, 10, 15 years ago too, if he can remember. So there we go. In the old days, when the, with the balcony, right? Yeah, yeah. Back on that. In fact, Reverend David came to our home one day years and years ago and, and asked us if he wanted people to have the experience of going deeper. So I think he saw something in us we didn't really see. But he asked if we'd come do like a little series, an evening series, to, um, and we came and did that. I think people actually came, too. Yeah. Yeah. Two, right. So, but we do get this great energy, right, when we have the mystical experience of seeing this oneness, and we don't want to squander it, this infusion of energy. We want to contain it, to contain it in a quiet and spacious consciousness, to allow it to permanently make a shift in our own operating systems. It's also, so that unitive, or it's also called non-dual perception, becomes our ordinary state of being. And this seems to me like the only way to deal with our times, to have a long view, to see from this experience of oneness. And it's a learning curve. It's a strengthening of our nervous system to go from seeing oneness to, from seeing, oneness to seeing from oneness. And for a map, well, I love, there, I love the parables about the treasure and the pearl. See, that, that, that to me reminds me of something. And um, from the 13th book of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which somebody finds and hides. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On, on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. What is that to sell all that you have? I mean, and who'd want to buy it anyway? To sell all that, your ideas and concepts and prejudices and opinions and habits and family and ra your racism, your stuckness, your non-negotiables, your line in the sand. What is that like to risk everything? Because that's what Dorothy did. She risked everything. Poet Donna Markova um, challenges us to risk our significance. And that's what Dorothy did. She risked everything to get the treasure in the field. She risked everything to get the pearl of great value to return home. She travels far. She risks everything. She returns home an entirely different person. She's transformed the hero journey. T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration and at the end of all our exploring, we will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. There's a new report by the National Institutes of Health that says more adults and even kids are practicing yoga and meditation. Spiritual practice, meditation, mindfulness, seeing from our oneness. That's the treasure. That's the pearl of our time. Letting go of the quick fix in order to move into the real knowing. That's the map, I think. Jack Cornfield, though, says, meditation is like being in a phone booth with a psychopath. <laughs> right? Right? 
It is slow going, isn't it? It is slow going. But wow, that is the way, right? It ain't the quick fix. It's that deepening into your knowing and deepening even further. And that maybe is the yellow brick road leading to the renaissance of spirit that Jean Houston gives us that sort of mantle to go on. So I have an affirmation for us, because that's what we do here, right? So our affirmation is, I'll go ahead and say it first, then we can do it together. A renaissance of spirit invites me to live from my spiritual depth. I am the her hero, heroine of, in my own story, together. A renaissance of spirit invites me to live from my spiritual depth. I am the heroine in my own story. And it is so. Namaste, shalom. Thank you.